Welcome to Celebrating Act Two. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome once again to Celebrating Act Two. And of course, we are pleased to welcome uh, one of our regular contributors, Dr. Liz Lister, MD, MPH, and by the way, a number one international best selling author. Dr. Liz, welcome. And I got to tell you, my favorite book of yours is Dr. Liz's Guide to Thrive at Any Age. Yes. It's a good one. <laughs> it is. It is. Okay. I have a question for today. Uh, maybe you can help us with. Uh, we hear a lot of things about a uh, uh, number of uh, tests that are being given and maybe ratios. And what's the most important thing for us to be looking for uh, to know that we're getting a, a, a decent sampling of testing? Do you have a, can you help clarify that for us? Uh, yes, I can definitely shed some light on that. I think the way you just asked the question was kind of a million dollar question. I think those are the answers that a lot of people are looking for right now. What exactly should we be doing to get this entire, this whole pandemic, number one, under control from a medical standpoint, and number two, to be able to get people back uh, into their workplaces and uh, be able to live life uh, closer to what we had before. Okay, so what should we, okay. what should we be looking for? All right. So the number one is the original recommendations of staying at home if you have any kinds of symptoms whatsoever, because we there's just so much we don't know. One of the biggest challenges of the numbers as we are going forward is what is the denominator? What's the lower number of the ratio of how many people have the infection versus how many people die? OK, obviously the worst case scenario. Okay. We know a lot about this illness now, the illnesses as COVID-19 uh, caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Okay, Even that, all the terminology is kind of challenging and is being used interchangeably, and it's kind of a challenge. So the first question is, how many? we don't know how many people have had the infection and really didn't have symptoms. The asymptomatic carriers it would be amazing to know what that number actually is because then we would have a much better idea of the lethality of this virus. Okay, it appears to be a much more lethal virus than the regular flu. Okay. And that's what people are arguing about those numbers because we know that we have hundreds of thousands of cases of flu per year and we know that we have relatively few deaths. Okay, so, so the, the, that's one of the challenges. Uh I know that that's all important, and sure, because then if 80% if of the people have had it and recovered from it, then we probably aren't going to have that uh, uh, many more people uh, get it, and then the hospitals won't be overwhelmed and so on and so forth. But uh, we hear a lot of things about, well, we're doing hundreds of thousands of tests, but isn't, isn't it really uh, uh, misleading because uh, we may do hundreds of thousands of tests, but we have hundreds of millions of people, as opposed to, let's say, South Korea, that had... Uh, fewer people and maybe less physical number of tests, but a larger percent of their population. What's the most important thing? for Exactly. So the statistic to look at for that is tests per capita. Oh. Per capita. Oh, that puts good. the total population as the denominator. Again, we're trying to figure out these calculations and uh, figure out Number one, how many people to test, how to get a representative sample. There's studies coming out every day where now the testing, the original testing was for the virus itself, for the genetic material of the virus. Now we're starting to already to look at antibodies. Who out there has antibodies, which means that they have this infection, whether they realized it or not. And of course, Dr. Liz, we have a situation where not only are we learning more about the virus every week, but we're also producing more testing and more equipment and more everything else. And the antibodies is a whole new thing. We've, we've gotten to the point where 
we now can almost look forward and say, OK, let's get a test for antibodies. Apparently, those tests are in the pipeline, but there can't be very many yes. of them yet. So we're going to have to deal with all of this information about the antibodies, just like we did with the the deaths and the uh, exposures and everything else. Yes, except, John, we're already facing a, a major problem with the quality of the tests that are coming out. There are actually at least 90 tests oh my that Lord. have come out of, a lot of them come out of China. However, there's a lot of tests being made in the U.S., biotech companies around the world. Germany's been working on tests. A lot of countries had tests before we did. We had some political uh, messing around that happened in January that held up being able to have good testing methods in the United States. So now we're dealing, and, and I, as a doctor, I'm getting pitched all the time. I'm getting promotions from laboratories. They're saying, we have a test kit that you can use and we'll ship it out to you. Of course, they're telling me that it's going to take two weeks to get the test. However, the biggest problem is what we call the sensitivity and the specificity of the test itself. If it shows a positive result, it's not 100% that that means it's actually a true positive, okay? And then specificity has to do with if you get a negative result, is that real? Does that really mean that it's a negative test, whether it's the virus or the antibodies? Well, let me ask you this. Uh, in your opinion, now you're in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, yes. When you have a sense of when there may be tests for either determining that you currently have it or that you did have it, uh, when will those be reliable enough and widespread enough? Or do you have a, do you have a sense for that? Because it seems to me that before we can yes. have, get back to normal, or some sort of normal, wait, right. not normal, uh, right. we're going right. to have to know a lot of this stuff so that uh, people know whether or not they've been exposed and go out or whether or not people they're working with have been exposed and so on and so forth. But you have a sense yeah. of when we're going to have reliable tests? Yes, I do. We, we have a few already, thank goodness. Uh, the problem is scaling those up, uh, which is why it's actually good. So what the FDA did in the United States is they relaxed their regulations. That's part of the reason there are so many tests flooded onto the market. However, that has also had this problem of uh, validating the test, okay? So for example, I, okay, so that's part number one is we are getting better and better every day. There is better information every day on the quality of the tests themselves. So that is coming, which then is related over here to the production challenges, making enough test kits, making enough of all the chemicals. A lot of those supplies come from China. Okay, so there's supply issues there, but all of that is getting addressed. So, so that's in progress. The, uh, another part of the answer to your question is there are basically three different kinds of antibodies. I, I don't know how scientific we want to get here because it does get a little bit complicated. There's basically three types of antibodies that can be measured, uh, but most of the tests check for two. One of them is the antibody that comes out a few days after you start to have symptoms, and then it goes away after your illness goes away. After you recover, that antibody goes away. So that's what we call the acute phase antibody. And then there's another one, which I, it is useful for people to know. So that other, the early one is called IgM, and then the IgG is the one that we're really looking for because IgG is the one that once the body makes it, it lasts. So anytime you get a vaccine or if a kid has chicken pox, they develop IgG antibodies to that virus and then they become immune. That's what we use the word immune. Now, we don't have that information yet. We don't know does, how long does IgG last in the body to the SARS-CoV-2 virus and is it actually protective? Does it keep you from getting infected? So I'm definitely hopeful that the answers to those will be yes. I don't, I haven't seen anything scientific yet 
that makes me despair, that makes me think that it won't confer immunity. However, we're looking, you know, China's only like three months ahead of us with all of this. And we're trying to look to the data that they're providing. I'm trying to trust uh, a lot of the data coming from various countries around the world, trying to validate that information so that we can develop a vaccine and, uh, and be able to move forward, not uh, fearful of our safety. Dr. Liz, this is great information. I mean, I'd like it to have <laughs> all the answers already, but you've put it into such Thank good you. perspective for us because let's face it, Americans are, I want it now, I want it my way. What's taking so long? And, uh, and right. we, just, we just are learning to live, I think, and wait and uh, like the rest of the world. So this is great information, really appreciate it. Thank you. A piece that, uh, one more comment I wanna add is, as far as what we know of how bad this virus is in terms of the illness, it really is worse than the flu. A lot of people are talking about that. They're saying, look, we don't know how many people are walking around without any symptoms. Uh, and I'm not talking about all the crazy comments that are coming out about who should sacrifice their lives for the greater good. I, learned, I don't even want to go there. Okay. But, uh, but this is definitely a worse illness. People who have had the illness and recovered from it are describing it. It is very frightening. It does require a lot of resources. People get a lot sicker than they do with a regular flu. We, we know that. That's not in dispute. That is what the science shows. And so I always appreciate everyone doing their part. We're lucky. I feel lucky in the Bay Area. We went into shelter in place a few days ahead of New York. And that has served, uh, has turned out well. Uh, thank goodness. And also thank goodness New York is on the, is getting, things are getting better there. Another is that I'm excited to be near a bunch of great universities around here that are doing very large what we call zero surveillance studies, where they're just randomly, well, I mean, there's a method to the scientific study, but they're checking these antibodies on the population and they're starting to, we're starting to get these numbers, how many people have had the infection and have done okay. So that's what we really need going forward. Good news. Yes. Well, I, 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 I for one, have, uh, never thought I was going to know this much about uh, antibody testing, uh, pro-body testing, whatever kind of uh, testing. And of course, we've all had to uh, live this over here. Uh, Cuomo, uh, almost, he's like uh, uh, the uh, Mayor LaGuardia of years back. He used to read the funnies on Sunday. He's sort of like this comforting voice on uh, every morning. But he's explaining that we need testing for this and for that. And we've got to scale up. And you've made it a lot clearer for us and hopefully uh, for our audience. So I thank you personally for that. Good. Awesome. And, and Liz, we're looking forward to hearing more uh, updates from you on the same topic in the future. But in the so meantime, in the meantime, if you want to if you want to hear more uh, about Dr. Liz, go to drlizmd.com and uh, you have a, a fascinating array of uh, uh, information up there and uh, links to all sorts of things. I follow you uh, uh, a lot on LinkedIn as well. And uh, I just saw something you did with, a, uh, I forget her last name, I think it starts with an M, April, where you talked about um, abuse and things like that. So you have a wide range of uh, interests beyond uh, hormonal therapy. So uh, I've been um, uh, really enjoying watching uh, many of your uh, uh, presentations and uh, and this being one of Thank them, you. making yourself available for this. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. See you soon. See ya. Take care. Stay safe. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.